Um, so obviously, I've looked at a lot of these kind of indicator mineral data sets uh, around the world. I've spent the whole career doing that. It's kind of my specialization. And so I'd like to share with you where this, this science or this geosciences has got to um, in terms of application in the real world. Um, and we're going to look at um, Sofatok and Chitliak, and then also just do a little bit of an interpretation on Angola. So on the top left of this front piece there, this is a, uh, a, a plot, uh, pressure and temperature plot, a climate pyroxene thermobarometry with uh, black data points for Safartok. That's in Greenland. We'll talk about uh, Greenland for a moment. Just notice here, very cold geotherm, very well constrained. And the right-hand diagram over here, this is, uh, this is a map plot of um, the Chitliak province, um, interpretations in terms of uh, little pie diagrams, I call them beach balls, and we'll do, look at that from Chitliak. So the question is, what is Chuck Fickke doing in the middle of uh, this diagram over here? Um, the reason Chuck Fickke features is because of the background in this image. Uh, Chuck has, over 25 years produced some of the most consistent, well calibrated um, and exceptional quality microprobe data. He standardized himself um, on standards that were produced uh, by the Carnegie Institute Washington, uh, as the Smithsonian standards. They were well used standards uh, in the mental community and have only recently been replaced by other standards. Um, and so his calibrated setup in his lab was, was astoundingly good. And I've been working with uh, CF Minerals research data for a very long time. And it's astounding what you can do with good data. So that's why Chuck features in, in, um, in this data set, the data uh, in this picture, um, the data from Greenland is mostly from Chuck's lab. All the data from Chidliak is from Chuck, Chuck's lab. Uh, BHP used Chuck's lab uh, uh, exclusively. Um, and then a lot of the open file data that's for the slave has come out of Chuck's lab. But there are other labs that are also had uh, additionally, additionally good, uh, good microprobe data. Um, it, um, it underpins everything that we can do um, in these uh, uh, these interpretations. Uh, for instance, uh, Dion de Brain also produced excellent data at the CGS in um, uh, off the, the microprobe in Pretoria. Um, it's a part of the, the professional practice that I've been engaged in in my whole career is to make sure that the data that I'm using is well calibrated. Um, and so there's the subtitle here with a focus on electron microprobe data. I'm not going to be talking about uh, laser ICPMS data. Um, it's not something that I have uh, I focused on in my career. Uh, as a result, I've had the privilege of, of, of working with, as uh, John just called it, big data. There's lots of big data out there today. Um, and there has been for quite a while. So let's kick off the, uh, the talk. Um, we've seen this diagram before, yesterday in fact. It's the first diagram that I put all the basics out on in terms of the mantle adiabat, uh, lithospheric geotherms, the graphite diamond stability field, and the fact that there's a hot geotherm um, for these kimberlites, uh, for the mantle underneath that was sampled underneath the Kuruman province. And I'm now going to bank that geotherm and do some reverse logic. If you want to find out where in this chrome calcium diagram, where all these different rock types are distributed in the mantle, you have to have a geotherm. Once you have a geotherm and you have temperatures for individual grains, whoops, like these hard spaghetti grains, these ones, these G10 grains over here, if you have their temperature, you can lo locate them on the geotherm and in the stratigraphy. So we know that in, in the Kuruman province, these Hartsburgites appear to be restricted 
to this um, to this interval in the lithospheric section. And if we do the same thing for these open circles over here, take their temperature distribution, which is this, this temperature distribution all the way over there, you'll see that that section has Lerzoli uh, throughout its entire length. And we then track down these orthopyroxene eclodites, which are very unusual rocks. Uh, they are the open squares. Oops. Their distribution is a little bit shallower in the mantle. And so you can build up a picture of the lithospheric stratigraphy, if you want, or uh, other people call it the lithospheric architecture. But it's a section um, in terms of pressure that you derive from the fact that you can get a temperature out of the garnet grain. So we're answering this question, what is located where in the mantle section, i.e. the mantle stratigraphy, or, and this, is the, this is a very interesting or, what and how much has been sampled by a kimberlite from a given mantle section? And as we will see, this becomes quite an important question because that variability is astounding. So there are many thermometry techniques that we can use to get a temperature from a grain. Um, you can use nickel thermometry for garnets. You can use zinc thermometry for chromites. I'll be using manganese thermometry for garnets exclusively in the rest of this talk. Obviously, you can get a temperature from chrome dioxide. You can even use temperatures from orthopyroxenes. And if you wanted to, you can go to calcium and aluminum and olivine, but for that you have to have uh, laser ICPMS data, which I'm not gonna discuss at all. That's a whole nother story. So there's a lot of tools in the toolbox these days and you have to pick your poison. My poison is manganese thermometry uh, for garnets. Um, and that underpins a lot of what you'll see in the, in the next couple of slides. Let's start with uh, Greenland. Here is the clinopyroxene, uh, 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 clinopyroxene pressure temperature plot for Greenland uh, in the framework that I explained a little bit earlier, uh, where that's a hotter geotherm, that's an intermediate geotherm, and in blue in the background is the cold geotherm for the slave. Um, the results from the Sofatok area in Greenland, which are about 550 million year old kimberlites, mostly dikes. Um, uh, constrains a geotherm that is marginally colder than the slave. You can see in the gray there, interpreted in, in gray over there. It extends up to the A diabat and not beyond. And you can divide it into three temperature groups based on the manganese content in the garnet. So I've just for simplicity colored garnets that give temperatures less than 900 degrees centigrade. So that's mostly in the graphite stability field. You can see there a temperature on this geotherm less than 900 degrees centigrade is in that part of the spectrum over there. Let me get my pointer going again. Less 900 degrees centigrade. This part of the geotherm is in the graphite stability field. We color that yellow. Then I've divided the rest of the section into two segments in blue, 900 to 1100 degrees centigrade, uh, and from 1100 up to the adiabat, uh, that's, uh, that's colored in red, just to give you the highest temperature. So this is a temperature scale, um, lower colors, yellow, intermediate colors, uh, blue, and then the hottest parts are red. Notice here that I've, I've I've chosen very large temperature intervals. That's 200 degrees centigrade wide. This one is wider than 200, 200 degrees centigrade. And the reason for that is the manganese thermometer has a one sigma error of plus or minus 90 degrees centigrade. So the bins are at least one sigma error bar wide. Um, and the reason for doing that is to make sure that you are not mixing noise with the signal that you're trying to track. 
So I'm trying to control the signal to noise ratio and that's deliberate. Uh, if I wanted to, I could make these bins much smaller, but then I will increase the noise ratio because I'm not taking care of the intrinsic error of the technique. So on open file, we had uh, 433 clinopyroxene data and an astounding amount of chrome pyro. And so this is often the case. You often see a lot more data for, for chrome pyrops um, and then accessing that data through the manganese thermometry um, then gives you a statistical leverage on your data set. So what do you see when you apply these manganese thermometry data in a map plan. This is the picture that uh, we published in 2009. Um, we took these three bins that you see over here in different temperature, de temperature bins and expressed them as a pie diagram for the amount of garnets that come from a single sample position. So this sample over here there's a lot of garnets in it. In fact, it's about 150 garnets recovered from that one sample over there. Um, and, and as you go through the data set, certain samples have much less um, and other samples are richer in, 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 in the amount of garnets recovered per sample. But when you look through this image, you start seeing beach balls, as I call them. This looks like a beach ball diagram over here. You see beach balls that are colored in different colors. For instance, this beach ball over here did not represent sampling in the graphite stability field. It's got no yellow in it. Uh, on the other hand, over here, there's one that has sampled predominantly in the graphite stability field and, and did not sample in, in, the deep, in the deep part of the mantle for some reason, but that's just the way it is. And so you can go from one sample to the next and start figuring out which part of the mantle is actually represented in the sample that I've taken at surface. When you do that for this data set, it becomes quite obvious that if you're looking for diamond, for the highest proportion of material that comes out of the diamond stability field, then you just start looking for the red and the, uh, the, red and the blue. Uh, pi diagrams, which is over here and over there. Um, and they're over there and there and there. But once you move away from this, this, this part of the, the, the section over there, you start seeing a lot more yellow. And in particular, in this part of the, uh, so the, the, the map, there's, there's very little red and there's quite a bit of yellow sitting up here. So if you, had to, um, if you had to go and sample somewhere or go and follow up somewhere, your first point of focus would be uh, sort of in this area over here. And then also this little area over here where there's two, two samples that have a high proportion of sampling in the diamond stability field. And that's what um, um, Hudson Resources, uh, uh, the CEO of Hudson Resources at that time was uh, James Tour. Um, he then took this open file data set, uh, gave it to me and said, uh, do your magic and uh, tell me where to go. So he went over here to a place called, that was subsequently named Garnet Lake. They found a little lake there. The lake shore had lots of garnets in it. Uh, it was like Exeter Lake in, in, in the Slave Craton. Um, and they then found kimberlite dikes. And they sampled the kimberlite dikes for micro diamonds. And that's what they found. Um, they found kimberlite dikes in situ with micro diamonds in them, 108 kilos, a fairly flat micro diamond curve, and ultimately ended up pursuing a, a dike setting there called Garnet Lake. The grades weren't fantastic. They were about uh, 20 carats per 100 tons. Um, but they very quickly focused on you know, their target area over here. They also followed up stuff over there in the, uh, afterwards. Wasn't that encouraging. It did have diamonds. Uh, they didn't spend a lot of time up here. 
But one of the things that you can start seeing from the variation of, of this data set is that when you start mixing these kind of garnet uh, thermal profiles, if you can call that, these are beach balls are basically represent thermal profiles. If you take these garnets, you erode them down into the stream bed and you mix them with these garnets over here, you end up with beach balls that are very well sorted and they all look quite similar. Um, in fact, Chuck Fipke's company took all these samples. They were all analyzed at Chuck Fipke's lab. And so this gives you an indication of how you start mixing different populations together and blending them uh, in the secondary environment that is of interest to people like Mike DeVitt and so on. Uh, how do these indicators then get transported um, and out into um, sediments that are collecting uh, in this fjord over there. So that's an interesting aside. Uh, I was actually quite surprised to be able to resolve this, um, you know, this kind of picture uh, at, at Safartok. And I became interested in, well, what is the fine structure in this, um, in this data set? And that's what I'll talk about next. Just please forget that the, the background is in this image. Uh, that was a mistake that was made early on in the drafting. Um, just remember that this, this cloud of beach balls that you see over here are spatially correct. They're not in their correct location, but they are spatially, the spatial topology is correct. So what I became interested in is um, these high count uh, portion of the data set. I just want to change something over here. There we go. Um, the high count portion of the data set larger than four garnets recovered per sample was 30% of the data set. And I was interested to see, well, what do you see in the high count portion of the data set? If you had to select high interest areas out of this data set, what do you find? Um, and what you find is highlighted in white, um, areas where there's predominantly red or blue and little yellow, those are areas of interest because they give you um, a signal that comes out of the diamond stability field. Um, and you would highlight those kind of areas um, highlighted in, in white over there. So those are areas of interest. And there are six distinct districts, one, two, three, four, five, six, and a couple of isolated samples that we have. If you now compare that to the remainder of the data set where you have recovered less than or equal to three pyrodes per sample, which is the dominant proportion of this data set, there's a lot of low comp data across this whole data set. Um, and it, you know, it's 70% of your data set. Then those are the same white areas that have been highlighted over there. And if you go into these data points over here, you'll see there's a little area of interest over there. There's another area of interest over there. And you start highlighting the same areas as before, but in addition, other areas like this one. That's a high interest portion of the data set. It's represented by one sample on the left-hand side, but represented by a lot of low comp samples on the right-hand side. And similarly, you can, you, know, you can go through this data set. I was absolutely astonished to be able to get this type of reproduction uh, of areas of interest with the low comp uh, portion of the data set. So this is big data at a low count rate. Um, and yeah, I was, I, was, I was blown away by the fact that you were able to do that because it gave you uh, a representation or at very high fidelity, um, even at very low count rates. Um, so that's of scientific interest, but it's also of interest in terms of exploration, uh, every grain actually matters. 
So I think that's all I'm going to say about Sufatok. Uh, that was my first experience of trying to um, uh, interpret things at a grain by grain scale uh, using manganese tomography. And it was highly successful as far as I was concerned. Um, we can now look at the chrome calcium diagram. We'll move away from temperatures. Um, this is the diagram that I think uh, Andy Moore was interested in seeing. It's a fairly unusual chrome calcium diagram. Comes from an open file data set. There's where you can find and reproduce this, these data set. There's 5,000, 5, almost 6,000 kind of data points over here. Uh, Andy, you'll notice uh, there's depleted Hartsbergite. It goes all the way up to almost zero calcium. These would be dunites. Um, they have an interesting disposition relative to this line that we, have, that we now have added to the chrome calcium diagram over there. And when you go above that line, where you're in the diamond stability field guaranteed on a cold geotherm, uh, the signal of Hartsbergite looks entirely different. Um, we can resolve that because we now have temperatures for each of these grains using kind of the manganese thermometry. Um, and when we do that, using the calcium intercept projection, which I uh, explained yesterday, we get the picture on the right hand side. Here's the diamond stability field. It starts at about 900 degrees centigrade and it extends to depth in the subcalcic part of the spectrum. So there are definitely Hartsbergeric garnets um, sitting in the diamond stability field, and that's where your diamond potential would be. Most of those are these kind of compositions, and there are some of these that are those compositions over there. But down here at low temperatures, and in fact, very low temperatures, all the way down to 600 degrees centigrade roughly, is this material over here. This is very depleted Hartsbergite, and it's sitting in the graphite stability field. Um, and it's something that we are not used to in the Cobval Craton. This does not occur to any extent in the Cobval Craton. The Cobval Craton does not have depleted material sitting in the graphite stability field to the extent that you can see in Greenland or in the Slave. We have the same situation sitting in the Slave. Um, I think that's all I needed to say about the Sephardic garnet compositions. So here's a summary. Thinoperoxin and garnet are well preserved in a cold climate. That helps. Um, these new age pressure temperature techniques are easily applied if you have high quality probe data, and we do. The clinoparoxin geotherm is quite cold. The diamond window is about 900 degrees centigrade. We have about 6,000 garnets and 1,500 samples are sufficient to pinpoint the diamond potential across the property. It's like a first phase follow up data set. Um, manganese thermometry applied to these garnet G9 and the G10 garnet compositions. Uh, it's the G9 garnet compositions that probably there's lots of them. It's their thermometry that supports the beach ball, beach ball interpretations that I showed you in the previous slides. And so that gives you the statistical leverage. It's sense checked. There's a high, high fidelity uh, manganese thermometry outcomes because of the, the low contrate signal that you can recover. Make sure that you check your one sigma error. Uh, if you if you don't keep that in mind, you will start mixing your signal with your noise um, and you won't get these high fidelity outcomes. There's a very high proportion of G10 garnets. Look at the signal up here. Most of them are graphite facies on the cold geotherm. And there has been substantial shallow mantle sampling at temperatures less than 900 degrees centigrade. The diamond potential is related to the deep mantle sampling of G10D grains, these, these ones over there. Um, and the microdiamond results reflect the highly variable diamond potential. So that's something that John Gurney teaches everybody or used to teach everybody. Uh, indicator mineral chemistry needs to be sense checked against the actual diamond result. These days we use microdiamonds for that purpose. 
We're going to move on to Chidliak. Um, I'm not going to be concerned with all of these technical details, so I'll just cover them off very quickly. I just have to point out this is all published. There are three publications from 2012 up to uh, 2018 that records the evolution of stuff that we did at the Chidliak project. Um, the Chidliak project occurs in Baffin Island in Canada. Uh, I was involved with this project by way of Peregrine Diamonds, where I was the VP Exploration. And so we had a field day in terms of ap applying these techniques. Here's a chrome calcium plot for, um, uh, for Chidliak as published in 2012. Um, there's some ecligaric garnets, there's high sodium uh, ecligaric garnet compositions over here. It turns out many of the diamonds from Chidliak are, are ecligaric. Um, and this signal um, is an important signal to keep track of at Chudliak. Um, we've, we've managed to constrain a very, very cold geotherm. Look at this. It's colder than the slave craton. And it has a kink at high temperatures, um, which is another part of the story that I don't need to discuss at this point. So I will leave that part of the story alone and go look at the manganese and titanium uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, in other words, the beach balls that we were able to construct for Chidiac. Before we go there, we did a little modification to the manganese thermometry or the beach ball um, uh, representation. Basically, we added one high titanium class. So the same temperature classes based on manganese thermometry, yellow, blue, and red, uh, the same temperature brackets, We've just added a black, um, a, a high titanium category, um, uh, just as a black sector in the in the beach ball. Um, these were some of the first in, uh, outcomes that we got at Chidliak that were of interest. So there are known discovered kimberlites. Their beach balls are shown in um, uh, these squares over here. So this kimberlite, this set of kimberlites over here have a very unique beach ball pattern. It's mostly low temperature. Uh, these two kimberlites that are actually underneath the lake, very difficult to get at. Um, they have a completely different beach ball pattern. And the indicator minerals that then are down ice, distributed down ice from these sources, they follow the beach ball patterns of the source. And so you can start uh, figuring out what your source looks like from data that is, you know, a couple of kilometers away in the Canadian Arctic setting, uh, provided you know which way these indicators have come from the source. And in this case, it's very obvious. Um, it's it's uh, the down ice direction is towards the northeast. Um, these beach balls clearly belong to these sources over here. And they didn't go up uphill and much further down here. There's very thin little signal of them uh, going that way. Um, but we can attribute this population to these sources over here. And what they see of the mantle is completely different from what these Kimberlites see of the mantle. So we uh, developed that, uh, that concept a little further. Uh, right in the central portion of, of the Chitliak province, we have lots and lots of garnet data. Um, I'll just uh, point out here in these square boxes, um, as published in 2018, um, this is the beach ball signal you get from a Kimberlite called CH1. It's actually off the picture on the north over here. Uh, CH7 has two different phases in it. They've seen slightly different versions of the mantle. CH7 is located over there. Um, CH45 is located over there. Um, it has a different uh, beach ball pattern to CH44, which is located over there. Um, and then there are also a CH8 located over there and CH46. The reason they've got orange circles around them is these two kimberlites don't contribute. They don't actually, if you do the beach ball pattern or you try to do the beach ball pattern out of them, uh, you don't get much out of them because they don't have a lot of garnets in the kimberlite themselves. 
there's a quantity of garnets that are in individual sources. Um, also changes, it's one of the things that changes in this data set. Obviously at CH7, we've got enough, CH45 and so on. And so if we interpret the beach ball pattern that's, um, that's represented over here, notice the scale, that's one kilometer. These kimberlites are less than a kilometer apart. That one's about one and a half kilometers away from that one. That's about you know a kilometer over there, maybe two kilometers over there. You can interpret this at a very close uh, close range interpretation. Uh, there's CH62 over here. It has distributed a high count uh, garnet data set. The beach balls are quite large mostly from the graphite stability field. Um, and it's gone downhill all the way down here. The glacier has basically flowed downhill and put a wash of yellow color all the way across these sources of the earth and even into there. All of this is attributed to a single source that is highly prolific in terms of the amount of garnets it pushes out into the secondary uh, environment. To the extent that the signal that you see from CH44, which is over here, that signal actually gets obliterated by the extra yellow that's been added. And it's only when you go down in this part of the sector over here that you start reproducing the signal that is from CH44. Um, and we can do similar interpretations for, for the garnets that are shedding out of CH7. We know what the source looks like. Um, these patterns over here are very similar to that pattern over there. That's from CH7. This one has an additional um, yellow and black from sources that are yet to be determined. Uh, they're likely related to what's coming out of this part of the spectrum and off the diagram over here. And then there's a whole slew of garnet sitting over here, um, many of which have a similar signal or beach ball imprint um, and likely represent a mixture of all the garnets that are coming from all the different kimberlites over here um, and were pushed to the west of this image by the glaciation uh, that occurred in this topographic uh, area over here. So it becomes quite a complex picture, um, but it's amazing that we can actually resolve this type of um, mixing of different garnet populations at this scale using just normal exploration data and, and good quality probe data. I don't think there's much more I need to add about Chitliak. Um, we did a statistical study on this data set just because it, you know, it became quite difficult to, to, manual, to do manual interpretation of the mixing of all the different components that are represented in this image. And as a result of that statistical uh, study, um, we ended up with this conclusion, temperature titanium attributes of Chidliac uh, protodic garnet populations can be resolved at larger than equal of 4% relative difference using multivariate statistical techniques. Uh, and the one we used in that talk was called Mahalanobis distance. Um, um, I was absolutely blown away by the fact that we could see differences of less, you know, of about 4%. Um, we see variable depth entrainment of the ambient protodic mantle. Uh, for neighboring kimberlites, I think that point was very well made uh, by looking uh, at this previous image. This is also known from global nickel thermometry data set, though it's often poorly appreciated at a local scale. Um, we can fingerprint individual pipes using this technique. Uh, and there's an implication that we can see all this variability from one kimberlite to the next, which is this. Proto-kimberlite melts precondition and materially modify the melt migration channel ways along individual ascent paths. Uh, you can also call it a conduit. This is basically the same statement 
as was made by Debbie uh, Bowen and John Ward for Carl, uh, based on their K6, LQ, GK, FK, K12 differentiation, but they did the differentiation in a different manner. They basically used distinctive diamond populations. I'm just using distinctive garnet populations, but it's the same story. At Chidliak, it turns out the deeper one third of the lithosphere is affected uh, by this, by this protokimbolite melt uh, uh, pathway as witnessed by polymic pyridotites and uh, Andy would be uh, pleased to know partial megacrist suites. We see partial developments of megacrist suites along different uh, melt channel ways. Um, and there's the evidence. Here's a melt veined garnet CPX dunite. Uh, there are the little protokimbolite melts sitting on grain boundaries. Um, and if you start looking at the indicator minerals that are associated with these melt migration pathways, that's a megacrystic climatoroxine. That's a megacrystic uh, ilmenite. Here's a similar rock type. Um, it's a climatoroxine dunite. It's ilmenite veined. Uh, this is all related to this protokimbolite melt that's um, that's ascending through the lithosphere at a very local scale. This was one of the first images that I put up um, when we started this lecture series. It's a, it's a cross section uh, at a grand scale across a craton or a conceptual craton as, uh, as, as portrayed by Maggie Lobsher on commission from De Beers. Um, I just want to revisit Basically, what I've just said, what I said earlier, um, individual kimberlites ascend or individual melt ascend from the interface of the lithosphere or stenosphere boundary in an off craton setting that's in the graphite stability field and is of less interest to us. I also pointed out uh, different ascent paths for different melts from inside the diamond stability field and the fact that you can sample the lower crust in that process. What I've just shown you is the evidence for this kind of process. Um, individual melts sample different portion of the diamond facies. You represent that by different beach ball patterns. Here's an example also uh, from New Liskard. Look at the difference here in terms of the temperature profiles for garnets, for clinoparoxines in this case. Uh, lots of clinoporoxine data at low temperatures. Then a dearth of information through the section over here, and then lots of clinoporoxine uh, uh, information at high temperatures, very close to the A dieback, but not above. Um, that's represented by this picture over here. This part of the signal is coming from there, and then there's nothing in between, or very little. Um, and then there's a, a pickup in, in the amount of material that's been entrained, uh, much shallower in the graphite stability field. Uh, you might as well be at a craton margin uh, in terms of the sampling pattern of the mantle that you can recover from single grains, in this case, clinoporoxine, and in the Chudliak case, um, uh, garnets. We're seeing much more of this kind of thing happening now. It's, uh, it's appearing in the published literature. This is a paper 2020, uh, Paulo Nimus with, um, with a, a team of De Beers people, um, uh, Robin Preston, Samantha Perrett, Ingrid Chin, that's just appeared in, um, in Lithos. Uh, look at the numbers of data. They've got 883 clinoporoxine pressures and temperatures. Uh, 543 chrome pyrodes, they use nickel thermometry. Uh, you see nickel thermometry data here, represented over here. Same temperature range as what you see out of the clinoporoxines from Kimberley. Um, there's a, got the geotherm going on in Kimberley. In that same paper, they represented um, the data set from Cullinan in South Africa. It looks completely different. Uh, some of the numbers of garnet, clinoporoxines and garnets analyzed. Look at the temperature sampling profile at Cullinan. It's completely different from Kimberley. There's a very high temperature imprint. You've seen that at Chidliak as well. Uh, the garnet thermometry gives you a very similar signal 
high temperature data, uh, very little um, at lower temperatures. Um, and if you go to the nickel thermometry data sets that are, are now available as supplementary data sets to this publication, um, this is what is in the publication. It gives you a mantle sampling profile at a temperature, temperature distribution for Kimberley um, that has different types of garnets, including high titanium ones, megatristic garnets, lurzolitic and Hartsburgeri garnets. This is what it looks like. Um, sampling in the diamond stability field. If you turn that into a beach ball, the beach ball would look like this. This is the data set from Cullinan on public, uh, on public file now. Look at the proportion of high titanium material that they see over here. Megacrysts over there, all of which are high temperature. High, high temperature, this is in fact the dominant portion of their high temperature uh, imprint. If you turn that into a beach ball, that's what it would look like. This beach ball is completely different from that beach ball over there. Um, we're getting down to very fine details with these techniques that are available to us. I just want to emphasize, if you want temperatures from garnets, you can use nickel thermometry, as was the case for this data set. If you only have uh, microprobe data, you can use um, manganese thermometry. Uh, I'm using an unpub unpublished version of the manganese thermometer. I'm still working on, on publishing that, um, but Creighton has a published version that you could also use. So that brings us to a little, uh, little bit of commentary on Angola. I've been working on Angolan data sets for a while. Many of them are not in the public domain. Um, I won't be talking about stuff that's not in the public domain. Confidential stuff stays confidential. However, what is in the public domain is worth talking about. So one of the things that I put in the public domain was a CPX data set, uh, 247 data points from the Lashinga Kimberlites. Where is that? The Lashinga Kimberlites are basically where you see Altoquilo 63, that's over there. Uh, it's about 120 kilometers southwest of Kotoka. And what we see in this uh, clinopyroxene data set from Lashinga uh, is a cold geotherm with a high temperature inflection, roughly at graphite diamond, uh, lots of sampling in the graphite stability field, uh, and some sampling in the diamond stability field over here at high temperatures. No, none of these temperatures are above the ADI value. Just want to make that point again. So what we see from Lashinga, about 140 million years old, those Kimberlites, normal cool geotherm, quite consistent with what you would expect from the fact that there are diamonds at Katoka and many other Kimberlites in Angola. It basically implies there is a normal or you know, a typical cratonic geotherm. However, some time ago now, Joe Boy, and Bobby Danchen, both of whom are not with us anymore, published a paper in the American Journal of Science where they described garnet lurzolites from the Kimberlite called Somaquanza. Somaquanza is sitting down here in the central portion of Angola. And to my astonishment, if you take their data and you put it on the pyroxene, the clinopyroxene diagram, you see a very hot, effectively off craton geotherm at Soma Kwanza. So Kwanza is dated at 134 million years. And just to make sure that this was not a flash in the pan, I also plotted it on the orthopyroxene diagram, which we can use for the same purpose. Guess where it plots? Very hot geotherm. So there is at roughly the same age. Um, Across Angola, there, is, uh, there are different geotherms represented uh, in the pub, on pub, based on public domain information. And I was surprised to find that Soma Kwanza has as hot a geotherm um, as, as portrayed uh, in these diagrams over here. 
Um, it is unusually hot. It has to mean that there has been a rifting event of some nature, and it's represented in this part of the Angolan uh, setting at this age. So I think the other thing that we can see from Angola is we can see Ghana data sets uh, very early on, 1992, a Russian guy put out 25 data points for Kamafuka Kamazamba. So where is Kamafuka? Kamafuka is on this diagram over here. It's a little bit west of, of, of Kamutwe um, and a little bit south. So it's between Katoka and Kamutwe uh, on the western side, roughly over there. Um, and I looked at this data set for a long time before I started believing that it's real. Um, the pressure that you would get out of that composition over there is the minimum pressure. And it's larger than 59 kilobars. It tells you there's some very deep mantle around at Kamafuka. Um, if you don't believe that pressure, well, this one would be about 55. Um, and then there are also loads of little corners over there, as, as is expected. Um, it took a long time to have that pressure reconfirmed. And the people who reconfirmed them with De Beers right, in 2012, they published a very good paper about uh, their exploration findings in central Angola in the B province. And they had two Kimberley clusters there uh, on the Lubia property. The Lubia cluster, it's in the northwest of that property. It's in uh, uh, this part of Angola over here. Very big data set, 17,000 data points on this one graph. There's a 60 kilobar grain. We've seen this data set before. We've discussed it before. We've said um, it would be associated with deep lithosphere. It's likely not an Archean lithosphere. It's a Proterozoic lithosphere. This is where it comes from. Uh, it looks like there's a Proterozoic lithosphere sitting underneath this part of the Angolan crater. In addition, in this paper, they described seven pipes, which are slightly different in their setting on the same property. Um, these pipes have sampled the same lithosphere, but in a completely different manner. And so the signal that you recover from this lithosphere by way of these pipes, it's a little subcluster, looks completely different just because of the sampling pattern of the mantle. Now the data is actually not with this um, with this uh, data set. Um, only the chrome calcium plots were, di uh, were were published, but just from the chrome calcium plots, you can already make the distinction that these kimberlites are in the same property. We assume they're the same age or similar age. They have sampled the existing mantle that's there in a completely different fashion and that has changed the view of their prospectivity relative to these Kimbots over here. Uh, by the way, they did, uh, De Beers did follow up 14 of these 37 pipes in this cluster uh, with microdiamond sampling and 12 of the 14 have microdiamonds in them. Um, but the indications were that these were low grade Kimberlites and uh, De Beers let them go. So how deep is the subcontinental lithospheric mantle in Angola? Well, it goes up to at 60 kilobars. It might go a little bit deeper than that. What is the nature of that mantle? Well, it doesn't look like it's Archean. Is it being sampled in, by, in, in a different manner by different generations of Kimberlite? For sure, you can't, uh, that's the explanation for the difference between these two plots that you see over here. So there's not much more to add um, because there isn't a lot more uh, uh, that's available in, pub, in, in, in the public domain. I've compiled from lots of, lots of different sources this, uh, this, this data set. These are some of the sources that are, that are uh, disclosed over here. Uh, the public data set is now strong, nearly 2,000, uh, 3,000. Um, uh, it includes uh, data from Katoka which I've just, uh, there are two data sets from Katoka. 
um, which I've transposed on top of the Lubia data set just to see um, what the comparison might be. Um, and it looks like the Lubia data set in the background over here is not too dissimilar to what people are getting out of Katoka. So potentially the type of mantle that we see in, you know, in this chrome calcium diagram over here extends all the way through there and it's sitting underneath Katoka. Uh, it may well be sitting underneath Kamafuka and all the way up to Kamutwe. There's some Kamutwe data in here as well. Um, so there you have it. That's what we can say about Angola. Um, do we want bigger, uh, higher pressures than 60 kilobars? No, that's deep enough. Uh, are we going to see lots of periodic G10 garnets um, in the Angolan setting? No, I don't think we are. Um, so we are not looking at a carp vol or a Zimbabwe craton analog. This is a different beast. Um, and in this beast's setup, eclogaric diamonds will count. I'm waiting for the day that somebody puts out a diamond inclusion data set for Angolan diamonds that has not yet happened, but I'm expecting to see a lot of eclogaric diamonds in Angola. So here's some conclusions. If you apply this thermal barometry in diamond exploration, um, we've seen these conclusions before. We've seen all these applications. Today we discussed Safato Chidliak, Kimberley Premier, and we had a preliminary look at the indicator chemistry for Angola. Uh, I think the point to make here is microprobe data are affordable and you can usefully apply them. Uh, single CPX geothermal barometry is here to stay, as is pyroxenocrust thermometry. And with that, I'll open the floor to comments or questions. Thanks, Herman. Very interesting. I don't see any um, questions on the on the chat yet. And Herman, I mean, looking at, at Angola, you've obviously done some work there and going back to the work done at Alta I mean, when you did find diamonds, um, did you get any, any sort of sense of the inclusion characteristics from those diamonds? Yeah, well, look, um, people simply don't <laughs> Diamonds are a commercial uh, venture in Angola. Yeah, sure. The, right now, you know, the, the level of sort of research or, or you know, that capability, some people, they're, they're, the people aren't even interested. Um, I'll be talking to, uh, particularly with a new diamond hub that's in, Sor in Sorino, so with the manufacturers. Mm. There are going to be off cuts from diamonds, and the thing yeah. that they cut out are the inclusions. And I'm going to see if I can start something um, on that front over there. Yeah, we need to go and have a chat to Jacinto Rocha and, and you know, impress upon him that we need some, some good research data out of Angola. Maybe he's got influence. Yeah, there are other people we can talk to as well. <laughs> Or particularly your old, colleague, your old colleague, like, um, you know, De Beers and Ken Tainton at Rio. Yeah, look, we just, we need to, we need to go and speak to the cutters. Yeah. The, the people who do all the brooding, the serenes um, uh, of this world, they cut out all the pieces that are not of interest and uh, we can give them, you know, $20 a carat for that stuff and that, that makes good, uh, good research material. <laughs> Good point. Um, the, the line of kimberlites in, in Angola is broadly parallel to the one in Southern Africa that goes through Botswana. Um, and th there seems to be a little bit of a time sequence in, in, the, in the South African Botswana line, but uh, not so much in, in Angola or um, do you just not have enough dates for that? No, look, so it's, a, the, it's the latter case and the um, dating of Angolan kimberlites in, in its infancy. Um, while I was with um, um, the Altaquila project, I, um, I got into dating. You know I do dating of kimberlites. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of that. 
um, I got into the dating of the Kimberlites. That was published in that paper on the Lushinga, uh, Lushinga Kimberlites, those dates. At the time, we collected more age dates than the rest of Angola combined. And we only published about seven or eight of them. But the interesting thing is uh, on that Altaquila property, we have ages that go from 145 million years to about 108. So that's actually quite a big range. We have Kimberlites erupted in one place, spanning 145 to about 108 million years. Were those zircon uh, ages, um, or, or what were you dating, Herman? Yeah, uh, Andy, uh, dating Angolan Kimberlites because they are so altered is a whole nother ball game. You won't believe how much trouble I had to go to to. Um, to get perovskite ages. So some of them are perovskite ages. There is one zircon age um, um, and it's published in that paper. Um, and we actually squeezed mica ages out, I think. Or did we ultimately, no, we, we, got, we got some mica ages, um, um, RBSR. It took an insane amount of effort to get fresh, uh, fresh flock of yeah. Just a point of clarity, uh, Richard Horn's asking about the naming in the chat box. So. Oh, let me just uh, see the chat. <coughs> Sorry, I can't, uh, I don't seem to see that question. What now, is the there? question is, is it uh, Luashi or Lushinga? And, and those ah. are in Kimberlites. So Luashi ah. is the new one. Um, that's yes. reported by Al Rosa, and but you're talking about one that was discovered previously in a different place. Yeah. 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 So yeah, let's just uh, clear that up for for Richard. Um, go back here. So Luashi is just uh, is about twelve kilometers southwest of Katoka. That's the new one that Al Rosa is talking about. It's the new development uh, in, in Angola. Uh, the Lushinga Kimberlites are on the Altaquilo property, um, and they are about 40 or so kilometers southwest of Luashi. Um, they are not anything like Lu um, uh, Luashi. They're a little subcluster of Kimberlites on the Altaquilo property, um, and they have their own characteristics. And, and there's many of them, Herman. I mean, lots of Kimberlites as you go out east there. Jeez. Hmm? John. You have, <laughs> John, there's a career. There's a career for people who are interested in Kimberlites in Angola. I'm counting I can, Kimberlites in Angola. Yeah, I, um, I know of at least a thousand Kimberlites in Angola based yeah. on geophysical images. Yeah.